Hey, good evening. I'm Susan Molinari. I'm a fellow at the Sign Institute, and I'm really thrilled to be with all of you, although sad about the circumstances that we have to all do this in social distancing ways in order to communicate. Um, I know these are difficult times for everybody, and I just appreciate our ability to come together and share some ideas and share some thoughts. And if you will allow me to channel Governor Cuomo, because don't we all want to channel Governor Cuomo these days, we will get through this and um, this will be over soon. So in the meantime, um, we're going to use this time to continue a program that we started at the Sign Institute um, to talk about campaigns whether it's the, the elements of a campaign particularly, whether it's a campaign for public office or a campaign for a movement or a campaign to get your first, your, your first job um, or ask someone out for a date, there's always the same elements that are there. We talked initially about in one of our classes knowing your audience and making sure that you know who you're speaking to and your relationship to that person. And then if you need to, how to adapt that message. And that's where polling, sampling, and all those other insights can come from. We also talked a little bit about coalition building. Are there opponents that you can either neutralize or bring into your crowd? And how can you make that crowd your movement? And all of that is contingent, the success is contingent upon being able to break through all the other noise that's going on in our lives, right? And when we talk particu particularly about politics, how do you make sure that your voice is being heard? And that really requires a special skill, some imagination, and I think an authenticity that really makes the difference between those who can do it well and those who do not. So I am just so thrilled that we have Latasha Brown with us today, today to share her thoughts and her voice with us. But before she begins, I'm going to introduce my student associate, Chris Rodriguez, who is going to give you a little bit of background um, to Latasha and um, ask the first question. And we also have you know, the question and answer ability, capability here. So during the course of this, if anybody who's watching has a question, just type it on in. And again, thank you for joining us. And Latasha, it is such a blessing to have you here with us tonight. So thank you. Chris, take it away. Hi. Uh, Latasha Brown is an award-winning organizer, philanthropic consultant, political strategist, and jazz singer with over 20 years of experience working in nonprofit and philanthropy sectors on a wide variety of issues related to political empowerment, social justice, economic development, leadership development, wealth creation, and civil rights. She is a co-founder for Black Voters Matters Fund a power building Southern based civic engagement organization that played an instrumental role in the 2017 Alabama US Senate race. Ms. Brown is principal owner of True Speaks Consultant Incorporated, a philanthropy advisory consultant firm in Atlanta, Georgia. For more than 25 years, she has preserved as a consultant, she has served as a consultant and advisor in individuals, donors, government, public foundations, and private donors. Throughout her career, Ms. Brown has distinguished herself as trusted expert in resource and political strategy, rural development, and special programming for a number of national and regional philanthropies. She is a founding project director of Grantmakers for Southern Progress. Uh, and the first question is uh, to Ms. Latasha, how did you get here? Thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you, Susan, for having me here. Uh, this little light of mine, go. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Uh, what well, we all need. Thank you. We need that. I wanted to start um, in the spirit of that song yeah. and in the spirit of where we are right now. And um, before I even answer the question, I do want to acknowledge um, the people who have joined um, and say to you, let your light shine in this moment. I know this is a really difficult, challenging moment for us. And we all are experiencing our own level of trauma. Um, with what is happening right here, whether it's personally in our family or how it's disrupting our lives. Um, but this is a particular kind of moment that we've got to really get centered back in terms of reminding ourselves of who we are. And so I just want to encourage you all and say thank you for joining us. And this is a moment for us to be really reflective. And so I want to ask the questions as, um, as, as authentic as I can answer it, but I want to put it in the framework 
of um, what I think is being called of us now, like the moment that we find ourselves in now. And so part of what my spirit, even in sharing that particular story, is that oftentimes, you know, it's, it's, we have these plans, you know, we have these amazing plans of what we're going to do, right? My plan was I was going to grow up and be a corporate lawyer and I was going to make a whole, whole lot of money. Right? <laughs> um, I never really thought about, um, at the, to be honest, I never thought about um, being an organizer. Quite frankly, I had been an organizer um, for a couple of months before I actually figured there was an official title. I didn't know that. <laughs> Um, but so growing up, part of, you know, but part of how I'm wired is that there were a couple of things that, that were consistent about me. One, I always was fascinated about power. I always wanted to know who was in charge. I can even remember being um, in a little girl, five or six years old, and we would go to McDonald's and I wanted to know who the owner was. And my <laughs> grandmother would say, baby, I don't know. I would go to Walmart and I was like, mama, who's in charge? And she was like, what do you mean who's in charge? Like, she was like this, I was like, who owns the Walmart, right? And so I always had this fascination of knowing where power sits, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm not sure of how that, how, how that developed, but even now, when I'm going in places, I'm usually going in places and I find myself kind of scanning the room and I'm looking at the way, I'm, I'm looking at who has power, um, who carries themselves as if they're a position of leadership. And quite frankly, it's actually helped me become a really good organizer. I have a certain kind of skill of really being able just to kind of um, feel and sense people in a room. The second thing is I, I never liked bullies. Now, the funny thing is I was this little skinny child, but I would be the one on the block that would take up for, it didn't matter. Like my, my mission wasn't whether I win or lose. My mission was you can't treat people like this. There was some, this deep sense of injustice for me. I never liked bullies or I never liked this process of folks taking advantage. And mm -hmm. so even my own limitations, because oftentimes I would be the, the girl that would challenge the boy, the boy that everybody was scared of, right? Um, and who would bully folks, right? And, and, and so somewhere in that process, like I said, I probably, if I, if I think long enough or hard enough, it's so long ago, I don't remember. But I would recognize that there's a, there was something around um, bullying, which I think really leads to, I always had this sense of, something about things that were not just, yeah. just bothered me. And so part of that, um, and then the third thing, which I think is part of why I'm here now too, is I always like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness for all of us. I always like to talk. My, I remember like my grandmother would, I, my, my grandmother and my mother, I, I would talk so much and I would ask like a gazillion questions. <laughs> and, so. I, right? <laughs> and I remember one day my, my grandmother was saying, um, baby, um, just be quiet for a little while. Just be quiet. <laughs> and so I say that to say that part of that, all of that was kind of the shaping of who I am, my personality, of who I am as a person. And as I got older, um, because of that deep sense of justice, I wanted to have impact in the world. I always wanted and felt like I could make a change. I can make a difference. Part of that was, I think, the shaping of my faith tradition. I come out of um, the tradition of, of as a Southern Christian. Yeah. Um, some of it came out of my family, the values in my family. And so uh, throughout my life, I was looking for, I always felt this need to serve in different capacities. And so ultimately, it wound, I wound up being a, becoming an organizer. Like I said, I didn't know I was an organizer for six months. I had been an organizer. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know that's what they called it. And so being able, there was something about being able to connect with people, talk to people, and for us to all kind of like and, and, and feel the power of humanity of really advancing conditions, there's something about that that just spoke to my spirit. Mm -hmm. It made me feel like my little light was shining. That yeah. if in some way, if I could show up in the world in that way, that I could be, um, I could make impact and I could make influence. I wasn't really following the spotlight. That wasn't it, um, important of being the leader and being the one that's on the microphone. That wasn't that important to me, really being able to touch folks and be able to connect with them and share my truth and hear their truth. Um, there was something that was profound about that for me. And then ultimately, you know, it's interesting. I found myself where like I started being pushed um, mm -hmm. 
push to speak publicly and the push to say things. And so, so part of my shaping, I think, is an underlying is is a combination of kind of the values, the constitution, who I'm, who I am, and the path that I chose that I wanted to make impact on the world. I believe that I could make the world better. Um, in some form or fashion, and I want to contribute to that. And ultimately, that's what landed me in a space of becoming an organizer. So you organize, though, on on so many issues for so many causes, um, and and probably the one, well, you're you're so well known for so many of these causes, but Black voters matter. So, So there was something there that you saw early on in terms of empowerment. Um, And and it's so interesting because when you said, as a kid, you didn't like bullies. And I think, you know, that it's the same thing, right? We're we're not gonna let people bully us, um, particularly at the ballot box. And so can you talk a little bit about, you know, what drove you to that moment in terms of, you know, starting this amazing movement? So, you know, um, my partner, um, my business partner and I, Cliff Albright, have been doing organizing, he, I, and his wife who is both of our best friends, <laughs> um, have been doing organizing for about 25 years in different capacities. She's an attorney. He worked primarily in finance. And I worked, I was an, an organizer and a political strategist. Um, and I did a lot of work in philanthropy. And so over the last 20 years, we worked and we intentionally um, worked in the Black Belt of Alabama. And part of it is our, um, my intention to go back home mm-hmm. after school was, I wanted to make an impact in my community. Selma was home for me. Yes. And so, um, so here it is, this amazing place that has this amazing history. If people know anything about the voting rights movement, you know that Selma is key, yes. right? And so there's this place that's known for the voting rights movement, but I saw so much oppression. Mm-hmm. I saw so much um, uh, disparities yes. around yes. wealth. I saw so much, even voter suppression. You know, I have uh, the story myself. I'll, you know, I ran for office at the age of 28. And on the day of the election, the the, the race that I was in, I ran for a statewide race. It's a longer story. I'll just give the highlights. Um, I ran for a statewide election um, race. And ultimately, it was so close, it took them seven days to call it. So ultimately, they uh, it wound up being, um, I got informed that I lost about 131 votes. This was out of 80,000 votes. It was, a, it was a very, 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 very small. Um, 131 votes. And the race certified, the Democratic Party certified the race at 12 o'clock. Um, at 12.15, I got a phone call from my mentors saying that the Democratic Party was going to call me. At 12.20, I get a phone call. And in my phone call, it has been, um, I'm notified um, by the director of the party that a sheriff in one of the counties that I had carried overwhelmingly had forgotten that he had taken 800 absentee ballots and put them in the safe. Oh my God. And that somehow 15 minutes after the race was certified, he remembered that he had these ballots. And so in my own naivety, because they didn't teach me this in school, right? Or, for, or I missed the lesson. In my own naivety, I said, oh, wow. So there's 800 votes. That's a county that I carry overwhelmingly. Let's count the votes. And I was told, no, it's not that simple. The race is certified. It's over. The only way that you can get those um, uh, ballots counted is if you you got to get a legal remedy. And so in a race, I was already a young, this was my first time running. Um, it was just an uphill battle to really be able to challenge that. But that was the first time that, that literally... You know, I had I was involved in a race that I know unequivocally was stolen from me, yeah. right? And 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 it's not just me. I don't raise this about talking about me in some way as a victim. I'm raising it on how common that has been. Voter suppression has been, and particularly in certain communities, to the point that it's so normalized that it's almost like even in my case, in my case, it was like, oh yeah, that was bad. That was the wrong thing to do. Yeah. But no one was telling me. Move on. Yeah. Move on, right? Yeah. And so, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you steal the elections? And so, um, so out of that, that set kind of this context for me around the importance of protecting democracy and the importance of protecting this vote, this right to vote. And so, fast forward, it we find ourselves in 2016, and beyond the Trump piece, because I mean, I know we we would love to say that America's only problem is Trump, but we know that's not true. Trump is more of a symptom of. Um, of, in my opinion, is more a symptom than a problem. I mean, well, 
I'm not gonna say it because he is a problem. But <laughs> <laughs> but I think in, in 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 many ways, I think we've got to really be honest about fundamentally how there's some some uh, the fragility of democracy um, mm -hmm. in this country um, and how our um, disengagement or our uh, for our lack of engagement has actually led to where we find ourselves now. And so ultimately, you know, in 2016, um, Cliff and I decided that we wanted to pull together kind of our best practices of what we did well, which I tell people we do, um, you know, I do th three things really well. Um, I organize people, I organize money, I organize ideas. Those are the things that I do. And, I, and, and so we wanted to find an organization um, we wanted to found an organization that could actually put some resources on the ground because we felt like in order to change this country, you have to change it from the bottom up, not the top down. Just like trickle down economics don't work, yeah. trickle down power doesn't work, right? And so in that, we created this organization so that it's a fund, so that we would fund organizations, I mean, groups grassroots groups on the ground that oftentimes there's all of this focus, these resources on the presidential election as it should be, but okay. in many of these local races and these statewide races, there's no resources or no organization um, to actually help. It's like, it's either based on the political parties or the candidates. Mm -hmm. We felt like it should, the power should be with people. And so we built this organization in less than a year, we were able to um, distribute, connect with in every single organization, um, with uh, over 120 Black-led grassroots groups in seven states in the Deep South. Um, we distributed over a million dollars. We have four kind of components that we had. We had the funding, the second, and happy, helping with strategy. You know, the third is that we'd help with narrative shift, and fourth, the leadership development and capacity building. So part of our work was designed that we can actually build the infrastructure of grassroots groups yeah. on the ground. That's how you win elections. You know, it, it reminds me, I, one of my, the, I love the fact that Nancy Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi has said when somebody asked her about power and she's like, nobody gives you power, you have to take it away. And that, you know, to me, that's when you say power coming from the top down, nobody's going to give up that power. It has to be taken away from the grassroots up. So, uh, you know, you, you, yeah. Uh, and we've, we've seen where strategies have worked. Like, you know, part of the piece, we've, we've had some real successful um, impact in communities, not because we we showed up. We think of ourselves as special ops, because we also think that that's a problem too, that oftentimes what you see is organizations come in and they parachute yeah. in, they don't care about people, they just want to get those numbers. It's a numbers game, right? For us, it's not a numbers game, it's a people's game, right? It's really around engaging people. And then of course we do our data and our numbers and all of that. But part of what has happened, which is why we named ourselves Black Voters Matter, not Black Votes Matter, because there've been a whole lot of people that care about Black votes that don't care about the voters. Mm -hmm. And so even in the context of American politics, we so centered, and I think that this is a whole nother discussion we need to be having right now. We so centered our political future on, and on personalities right, that it is a personality, right, instead of really thinking about what is our responsibility in really protecting, expanding, and for the evolution of democracy. That ultimately, like even a, a prime example for me was what happened in Alabama. We were very engaged in the Doug Jones race. And so I'm quite frankly, many of the voters we work with did not know Doug Jones, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what we did is we had a different message. We said that this race isn't about Doug Jones. This race is about us. It's not about the Republicans, it's not about the Democrats, it's about who is going to be in the position that's gonna actually help reduce the harm that's happening to our community and be accessible to us. I really think that we've gotta think that way in this election, that this is not a, this election cycle, I'm just gonna put it out there. Like this election cycle is not about, um, it's far beyond, we're far beyond the conservative progressive uh, of debate, like on some level, right? Um, it's still valid, but we're really, facing, are we going to move forward with democracy or some form of fascism? When the president is saying that I have total authority, we can't take that lightly, y'all. And we can't just say, oh, that's just a Trump. No, that is a particular ideology. If you look and you read around fascism and authoritarian governments, you would recognize that that's the, found, that's the fundamental foundation. For us to be in a major pandemic crisis and states 
that 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 he that the the federal government that the president likes are able to get access to stuff in other states not something is fundamentally wrong and we can't keep having this conversation as if this is normal we can't have this conversation as this is just about who's going to win and who's going to be the best candidate we've got far more at stake right now and we've got to really see and step up in that position and to do something different and to speak about it and to dream what is going to how are we going to move america forward because we are in a new normal we're in a new so, normal so how so taking all that that passion how do you then translate it in terms of what your movement is going to be doing from now to the election so we have we've completely shifted you know part of being a good organizer is you have to meet people where they are mm -hmm. and the truth of the matter is right now people don't want to be in long debates around who's the yeah. best candidate and what's the agenda right now people are literally in survival mode they are right. literally Absolutely. trying to figure Trying out how is my life right right yeah. and so what we've kind of shifted our work to do is kind of three three buckets um one there's a bucket around mutual aid and support and so we've um black voters matter has launched a saving ourselves for self-determination initiative where we are literally giving resources we're putting money on the ground to some of the communities that are most vulnerable that are particularly in rural areas in rural areas what we haven't talked about you know and it would, this is this would be a whole nother class itself susan but what we haven't talked about is that those governors that refuse to expand the aca what that meant for the health care access in their states that in many of these rural communities the hospitals have closed and many of these rural communities just basic access to get to have health care um, um is a challenge and so what we've seen is that people in rural areas be able to get information one of the areas that we work with and work closely is in southwest georgia and in albany and and new york times even new york times and the washington post ran a story on it because at one point in, in a, a couple of weeks ago um it had the third highest per capita cases in the world right um and, and number one in the in, in in the u.s and albany is a small rural yeah, town sure. african-american in um, um in southwest georgia the point is i think what we need to do now and and where we are now is that one Part of our work is really trying to figure out to stop the bleeding right now, help people where they are right now. It builds trust. It shows consistency and authenticity because that's what we are. We care about people. And so we're doing a lot of that. We've got, we've been supporting groups that have been doing um, um, services with checking in on seniors. We've been supporting groups that have been doing online political education. We've been providing grants to organizations that have shifted their field work to kind of online. So that's one bucket. The other bucket has been really around um, election protection as well and around voter education that this is a moment that even though we're in this health moment, this is not the moment for us to put democracy on the back burner. We need to, we need democracy now more than we ever have. So have you guys taken a position on um, whether they, there should be um, absentee voting all, you know, all over? Yes, yes. So we are absolutely, we're, we're supporting um, absentee ballot voting and we're supporting, um, we're supporting mail-in vote, voting. We want some, we, we want there to be a comprehensive, we mm -hmm. have some concerns around the safety and security around that. And okay. we think that there needs to be some other measures in place. One in particular, we're actually suing the state of Georgia right now. Um, we filed a suit on the state of Georgia last week because they, they were sending, um, the state, Secretary of State is sending the ballots out and asking people to get their own stamps. So now you're gonna ask people, we're under a, a, a stay at home order. So you're asking people, now you put an additional burden. It's like a poll tax. And so part of it is not just about the stamp. Part of this is about the insensitivity, right? Of leadership. We put you in places of leadership right to not make people make a decision of whether they're going to live or die or uh, be in a democracy yes. but to really make a decision to make the hard decisions that literally are going to be the best interest of us all and so you know some of the things that we've heard we know that in chicago that at one of the polling sites where one of the poll workers has died and other polling workers in that in that site have been contaminated were con um were infected as well and so my point is why are we exacerbating a health crisis without being creative and committed enough to really figure out how this thing is done. And so you know, I, I was so, um, I mean, I, I thought it was an amazing, to your point about the, the cherish, how we cherish democracy. 
but at the same time, it, it made me frightened for all the people in Wisconsin who were willing to show up and stand online and, and do what they needed to do to vote at the risk to their own health. And you're right, we should never, I mean, I'm a Republican, but we should never ask people to have to choose between participating in democracy and their, their own health. And their I own agree, health. I agree. And, and Susan, I think that this is, and I raise this because, you know, Susan, I think that, you know, at the same time, that's why I'm, I'm at the same time that the Supreme Court justices got together, they were quarantined. Yeah. Right. They were safe. They felt that it was in their best interest and the people around them for them to be safe. Right. Why would we allow, why would you make a decision that you did, that you yourself did not provide the same kind of safety? And I, and I raise this because there's a fundamental values question that is really beyond talking about political parties. We've got to get beyond this. I don't know how we've gotten in this box that we are like- It's kind of like this, it's unimaginable. Which is why I'm happy to have you on here because I know we agree on so much, which is just the basis of what's important to this country and to families. And And sorry, full stop. (laughs) Right? Full Full stop. stop. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Right? But we've made everything be where we've actually allowed ourselves to be held hostage in these labels, right? That you're liberal or you're conservative or you're this. Let me tell you what I think that we've got to have honest conversations beyond the political partisan piece. Right now, if we don't really understand that the health of my neighbor impacts my health, sure, something is fundamentally wrong. Right. And it is great that you can have health care all day long. And it is great that there are people that can afford health care and have excellent health care. I'm happy for them. But how does that help you <laughs> when mm-hmm. other people don't have health care sure. and it impacts your health right now? How's that working out for us? Yeah. My point is that on some level, this is really this really has to go beyond our debate around these are my issues and these are your issues. This really has to be a can we have an authentic honest conversation in this country about how humanity, how human beings should be treated. And so part of what is so frustrating for me, even as being a political operative in this space, is um, is for us not to have the courage to be honest. And that in some ways, we assign ourselves to this kind of political value, right, that I'm not going to say anything. And I'm, and I'm raising, I know I, 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 I'm, I hate saying his, his name because I'm not, I promise you, I'm not trying to beat up on, on Trump right now. Um, but the truth of the matter is his leadership has failed. Millions of folks and particularly millions of folks in my community. And there may be others that feel something different. But at the end of the day, that what is important to me, I believe that this country has enough brilliance. There are enough brilliant people in this country. Right. There's enough people in this country that love humanity yeah. that we can have a leader that can go beyond their own small agenda and really be representative to the citizens and the human being and, and center human life. No one is gonna convince me otherwise. I, and, and although, let me, let me throw this at you. Um, no one should also be surprised that we're seeing an increase in death um, with regard to uh, people of color. That's right. right? Because it, it's, Part of that has been exacerbated is the exacerbation of the inequities and, and so many aspects of that pre that precede Donald Trump in terms of health and safety and access to health care and you know don't get me started on maternal you know deaths in this country like things that we just find it easier to um, ignore. I agree. Yeah. I, I, Susan, can I? I um, one, I'm. I so appreciate this conversation with you um, and then sharing this platform with you. You know, I really want, it's almost like I want to just go scream at the mountain. Can we really be honest? Yeah. Like, can we just be honest? Like if we don't learn anything else in this moment, at this moment, can we just be, in this moment, can we really be reflective of what is important to us? We have created a culture that now people think that their children are a bother. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying this in a way to be judgmental. I'm saying this in a way that even in my own life, I had to shift the other day when I had my niece asking me to help her. And in some ways I was like, oh, I got this work to do. What if there's something fundamentally wrong with that? There's something fundamentally wrong with that. We're in this moment in time, right? That their, their folks are really worried about, I got to go to, I got to go back to work. Even though I'm scared to go back to work, I got to go back to work or I'm not going to have a place over my head. There's something fundamentally wrong 
for us to hide behind American exceptionalism and say in some way America is the greatest and the best. Yes, we've got more cases than anybody in the world. That shows how, how, how the best we are. My point is part of what is going on in America right now, in my opinion, is that we're all being exposed. And notice what I said. No, you're absolutely are right. All being you're exposed. absolutely right. You're and absolutely so right. I am hoping, I am praying that at, as we come out of this, I want to be a better person. I'm hoping that my appreciation for my family has shifted. Mm -hmm. I've seen some things about myself and my work culture that quite frankly have been dysfunctional that I don't like that I've put my work before I've placed and many times my family. I have seen things around, I'm literally walking around my house like, oh, I like my house, right? <laughs> right? And I, it's almost like I'm discovering my house. You know why? I'm discovering my house because I'm never here. I'm always gone. Yeah, that's true, I'm sure that's true. And that's become normal. I'm raising that, not in a context of to be in judgment of other people. No. But the truth of the matter, y'all, we all have been so obsessed with chasing fame, success, money, whatever those things are, that some of the basic things, like unfortunately this, this, this pandemic has created, I was on a call the other day with a, a coworker and she stopped in the middle of the call and she was like, oh my God, I've been living in, and she lives in DC for eight years. I've never, this is my first time ever hearing the birds chirp. Oh my goodness, yeah. Right. There are, there, there are folks, I, I talked to one of my friends in San Francisco that's saying that she realized that she got a view to bay, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, my, my, my point is, yeah, I get it. there is something not sustainable. Mm -hmm. The way that we've been showing this up, this is beyond politics. This is really, if we're talking about kind of amplifying our voices, I think part of this is around amplifying our humanity. Yeah. We have allowed everything to supersede our humanity. We've let our politics mm -hmm. say that you are worthy and you're not worthy, right? We've, had, we've allowed our politics to say that it's okay for children to be in cages, yeah. right? When, when did we start doing that, right? We've allowed our, our labels, our political labels to say who I can talk to and who I can't stand and who deserves and who doesn't deserve. We, my, my, my point is, I really hope that we see this as a reset moment and not just a political reset moment. I think this is a huge, the whole world is experiencing this together. Yeah. Well, right. and I love what, what you just said though, because right, it, um, we are so fractured on so many ways, right? We continue to talk about tribalism, but what this pandemic has shown us is, and you, I've never thought about it till you said it, is that we can all come from our different tribes, but your health, your well being, your spirituality, all of that impacts me. It impacts my family. Right. And we just all of a sudden realized it. Absolutely. Not, when you're, yeah. when you're on a respirator, the people that are taking care of you, <sighs> you don't care if they're Republican or Democrat. Totally. When, you, when you're like literally fighting for your child's or your family member's life, or you have a member that is in a nursing home, the people that take care of them, you don't really care whether they're a Republican or Democrat. My point is we've allowed a false narrative to set some levels of, of, of values for us. Quite frankly, we've got to be honest and say it. And we don't say it, we make it just seem like it's around political agendas, that right. we're only having a difference around political agenda. No, what, we have not dealt with racism mm -hmm. and both parties have problems with racism in this country, right? Um, right. And, I will, and we've got a president who has openly aligned himself with white nationalists. We can fix it up, we can make all kinds of excuses, but we know. I don't have to go through all this. We know the truth, right? And so fundamentally, my community, right, is right now, at, we're only 12% of the population, but we're dying in droves. This isn't just because the virus likes, uh, we're going to affect no, them. No, that's right. It, it's showing the inequities that have, I mean, that's why I was saying before, we should not be all, oh my gosh, this is so surprising. Right, it's right. It's not. It's an inequity on so many levels that we just haven't wanted to pay attention to. Right, and we should be embarrassed. Absolutely. The bottom line is we should absolutely be embarrassed to even have the audacity to go around the world and say, we're the greatest country in the world. We're the wealthiest country on the earth. And yeah. every single person not have access to health care. I'm sorry. I don't care what. I know that's a particular position that people put me in a particular you box. You got the microphone, so you can. Right. Like people can put me in a particular kind of box. I don't care. The bottom line is what's the worst case scenario? That my neighbor will get well? 
Like, like, I don't, like, I don't understand this, right? Like, at the end of the day, fundamentally, I want my neighbor to have what I have. I want people to live in peace. I want people to have the opportunity to work and provide for their families and make wages to take care of themselves. I want every single person to have access to health care, not because I have some political agenda that I got to figure out, just because I think human beings deserve that. How about I, water? <laughs> right. And water. How about that? Then can we, ha can we have some birds singing every once in a while? I, can, I, just, I still, I, I still, um, I'm stunned when I realize that there's some parts of this country that can't, that are, where, where people, where mothers have to be concerned about lead poisoning for their children because they gave them water to drink. Right. Uh, so we have some questions from the audience because you and I obviously can do this okay. for years. Um, let's see, what is your prediction of Doug, of Doug Jones' re-election prospect in Alabama? Well, you know, I think we're all, we're, we're in a, a we're in an interesting moment right now. Um, I, it's a, we're in an interesting moment right now. I, um, where I was, I, I'm, I'm not sure how I feel. The, the, the honest truth is I'm not sure. Okay. Um, and this is what I mean by I'm not sure that I think um, it depends on how Alabama's being hit pretty hard right now and everything is in flux. Yeah. And so what I do know is that Doug Jones has done a pretty good job, I think, at trying to reach across the aisle um, and, and done a really good job at trying to really be able to balance and send a message. And so there's a course span of support. Um, my, my, in some ways, my disadvantage, in which I'll be honest with you all, my disadvantage is part of, of my um, secret superpower is that I've, I'm always, I've always have my ear on the ground. So mm -hmm. as an organizer, I'm yeah. always getting firsthand information. Um, I always have people that I'm connected to in different camps, different parties where I'm getting information from. And so because we're not engaging in the same way, yeah. um, I'm not getting information the same way right now. Um, so I'm not really sure. I think that it's very possible. Um, in some ways, I actually think it's more possible for him to uh, win this reelection this time. Um, he had an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Republican race, um, Jeff Sessions and, um, oh, I forget his name. Um, the Republican race got a little heated yeah. um, and it's, it's, it's some splintering in that party, um, in that party apparatus. So I, right now, I actually think that he has a chance. It's an uphill battle, but I actually do think he has a chance. And which brings up another question. How are you doing your job now as we're going into, you know, again, with, with everything that's going on, going into a really important election cycle, not only on the presidential, but uh, you know, at, at so many levels. How are you doing your job while you know, maintaining the distance that we all have to do right now? Are you relying on, you know, obviously, technology, et cetera, et cetera, but um, are, are you before, before the screen 24 hours a day? I was gonna say, the first thing I'm doing is I'm doing a Zoom overdose. So I, <laughs> you're going to need a Zoom detox. I am zooming, zooming. I'm going to need a Zoom detox. Um, I'm spending an, an enormous amount of time on Zoom. Um, so we're doing a lot of communication through our network. You know, the good thing about what um, the advantage I think that we have in our work, the way that we've been organizing is we've been doing relational organizing. So where oh, that means. So in relational organizing, we're organizing based on building relationships with communities and groups and organizations, okay. right? Yeah. So we don't treat people like, here's a flyer, mm -hmm. you know, just vote for that person. We're literally engaged in conversations with folks. We're engaged and we're invested in building a relationship, right? And with, with organizations and groups, that's why we support grassroots groups, right? And so... Um, with relational organizing, the power is in the building of the relationship, not necessarily in just the process of here, do what I say, do, right. or, or both right. for the okay. person. Um, and so because a way or three way conversation and yeah. Yeah, and, and literally building relationship, mm -hmm. ongoing relationship. Like once we go in a community, let's say there's a community that invited us and we go in, we worked on a DA's race, we don't leave that community. We never leave that community. Right, we're staying, we're staying in contact with those folks. We're still building, we're still envisioning together, we're still supporting their work. And so part of our approach has been building our networks by building and nurturing relationships. And so what has worked as an advantage for us in this, in this process is that's come, 
that's been very, very helpful in us being able to transition from kind of the field work to online. So mm -hmm. now we, because we have relationships, right? And so, and the people know us. And so they're not just coming to an open webinar. They're actually coming, they're talking and we're building almost like virtual communities. Mm -hmm. And so we've had to be really creative in kind of building virtual communities on how we're doing our messaging and how we're providing support for folks right now while they're going through this crisis. So I got a great question from one of my other student associates whom I absolutely adore, Aiden Levinson, who says, how do we build a nationwide message of respecting others for who they are rather than judging just based off their political party? There's an easy one for you. <laughs> Let me just say, whoever that student is, I want you to run for office. <laughs> Oh, he will. I right. can guarantee you he will. <laughs> I want you to run for office because that's precisely the question that needs to be asked. Yeah. You know, I think part of what we think is we think we, we have to have everybody. Like, let's convince everybody on what's right. The truth of the matter is, in the midst of when people are in crisis, mm -hmm. those that are courageous and step into that, yeah. that void of leadership, folks will follow. People are looking for good leadership. People are looking for folks with a vision. Mm -hmm. Folks are looking for people to occupy that space. I think part of what has happened is that politics has, has, has we've allowed politics to become this very partisan framework. And quite frankly, Susan, you know, I think part of what has happened is the party, the political parties have held, uh, held the, this political discourse hostage, yeah. right? Based on their own struggle for power. And so I think part of what what has to happen is I am hoping like your student and others that there is a generation of young leaders that are being politicized in this moment. And then even some of us at a season, please run, um, you know, um, that are being politicized in this moment that now you can see through the noise. Like now you can like yeah. right now, I, I have very little tolerance for political pundits just yeah. talking to, the, yeah. to run the whatever. I, I don't have that. that right, that. Cause there's life and death issues that are happening right now. Yeah. Right. And so I, so the, the three things that I would say is one, that literally find a political home. If you are listening to this, you need a political home. Find your group. Where is the group that you are actually kind of cultivating your beliefs and your ideology um, around this? One, that's what I'm going to ask you to do. The second thing is put yourself in a position to serve. That part of the way that you learn is by serving, whether that's um, being a being mentored by someone. I mean, you got the perfect mentor right here, Susan, right? Um, take advantage of asking her, what is it in being in Congress? Like the way, not just, not just her process, but her thinking. How does she deal? Not how she made those decisions that were easy, but when she was faced with hard decisions, how did she handle that, right? Mm -hmm. And really be able to learn and feed yourself around um, what that kind of leadership. And the third thing, which I think all of us should do, and I say this often, I say this with my class at Harvard, what is your radical reimagining of America? Ah. That, that's, we need a radical reimagining of this country. Mm -hmm. That ultimately, I love to say that if we allow this conversation about democracy, to, the only reference to that to be the founding fathers, then what that does for me is the founding fathers didn't even have enough insight to even see me as a human being or even to see me in this position right now. So clearly, they, they contributed greatly to the, the, the political discourse, but they were limited. Mm -hmm. And so now in this new world that we are in, yeah. in this new America that we want, some of us need to think like founders, founders of this next phase of America, of the evolution of America, the yeah. America that really can be and will be the greatest country of earth, on earth, not because of the health of the stock market, but the greatest country on earth because of the health of its citizens, its people, the way that it treats its people that right. that's what we will be known by and how we treat the world and show up that's what we'll be known by well i couldn't agree with you more it always um and i'm sort of answering aiden while i'm speaking to you i always said as a member of congress that if i you know could because i was always called a smush because i would a squish right because i would you know compromise and i always said like if you're if in certain issues we don't compromise right i understand that but you know, if, if, if I'm not going to compromise with you, I'm basically saying that my constituents are better, smarter, stronger than yours, right? Because we're only reflections of our constituents. And when right. we get to a point where we say we won't compromise, what we're saying is this is about me and you. And it, you should not be in office just about you. It's about all those people who Absolutely. you represent. Absolutely. And I have to have as much respect for the people that represent, that you represent, that I represent. Right? And, and that's where it breaks apart when we stop thinking, 
in terms of ourselves instead of our constituents. And I don't know, it just, uh, and that's why I agree with you when you say it's gotta be, the power needs to come from, from the ground up. It does. I, I mean, even the Constitution says that. The, I, find me a line in the Constitution that says we the party. <laughs> find me a line in the Constitution that says we the candidates. That's or we the line. officials. It says we the people. And so we've got to take that seriously of what that really means. That means that even when you're in a position, right, that you are in the position of power to represent people. Right. Not your own limited vision. Not of about you. Not it's about, not about you. it's so not about you. Will somebody please send your president a note that says it's not about you? But anyway, I digress. I won't be that one, but I get you. <laughs> so let me okay, so let me ask you while we're waiting for a few more questions. I, you ran for office. You probably won. You gonna run again? I don't think so. You know, it's so interesting. So many people are like, are you gonna run again? I was like, for what? Um, I, you know, at this point. At this point, I really want to help shape the landscape of democracy. I think democracy is far more fragile. American democracy is far more fragile than we would like to believe that it is. Yeah. You know, I think we're seeing some hints of it now. Um, and so, you know, if, if I, I'm not going to rule it out. If there's, if there's some opportunity and I feel like that's the best way I can serve, then that's what I'll do. Right now, my work, um, we're, we're building this, we built this organization that we're in 11 states. Um, yeah. We're doing work, really work that I'm proud of. I mean, it's hard work. Yeah, it's got to be. When you were in 11 states and you started in 16, did you say? We did. We started in 16. That's amazing. Yeah. I didn't realize it was that new. Yeah, it was that new. We, I mean, the, the, the maybe because we're so old, because I guess we brought... Check the roots out, lady. <laughs> but, but we were, and so I'm really proud, and there's two organizations, um, is uh, Black Voters Matter Fund and Black Voters Matter Capacity Building Institute, which is our C3 and then our C4. And so part of the work, like literally being able to transform and to see um, people get a sense of their power, Mm -hmm. Right. That's what go that's what's going to transform America. You know, I think even some ways we have we've been dishonest even in the field of political science. You know, we've seen um, we've seen kind of politics. We've put everything on. Well, policy politics will just change by policy. Well, yeah. when was Brown versus the Board of Education? Mm -hmm. That was 1954. Most schools were desegregated in yeah. the early 70s. Yeah. Why was that yeah. the case? Politics without people doesn't work, y'all. It don't work, right? And so I'm saying, I'm saying that because I think it's really important that we're understanding that the kind of parallel strategy that we need is that we do need policies that work for the people of this country, but we also need people engaged. And in some ways, we've kind of advocated our responsibility of, of literally lifting up and strengthening democracy and just say, oh, I'll just go and vote. Right, or maybe I won't vote, yeah. they'll figure it out, right? And so ultimately what we have is reflective of a country that almost half the people don't participate in the election. Which is incredible. It's incredible. It's incredible. So I have a question from Lucas, who's another one of my wonderful um, student associates. How are you using data at your organization to ensure your time and money is maximized? My practical guy asking the Oh, question. that's an excellent <laughs> question. So we have, the, the good thing is that's not the thing that I do. <laughs> We have a whole, we have, yes, we have a, uh, my partner who is like the data guru. Um, and we have people that we, we run our numbers. We're, we're very targeted. Um, on the C4 side, on the C3 side, we're doing capacity building. So that's very different. Um, but we actually use data to inform. We call ourselves not data driven. We call, what we say is we're not data driven. We're data informed. Why okay. do we say that? We say that because what we have seen is we've seen in, and um, campaigns that have been so data driven that I've been I've seen and witnessed okay. campaigns that would go to a house and if the person wasn't in the van system, they asked for the person, the person wasn't there, they walked to the next place. We were like, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, wait. right. Somebody right. answered that door, talk to them. <laughs> Hold on. If they if they answer the door, if you if you are a human being, we're talking to you, right? Yeah, I hear and so you. Part yeah. Of it is where we inform our strategies are mm -hmm. informed and all undergirded by data, but they're informed by the data. Our, yeah. our, what moves us and drives us is the agenda that those communities have decided. For example, we've had communities, um, I'll give a prime example of a community in Florida where it was during the governor's election. And so we were 
thinking that they wanted support around this governor's race and this amendment that was on the, the ballot to restore the voting rights of formerly incarcerated uh, people. And ultimately, what came out of our discussion with them was a school board race. And so we literally built our strategy around with them around this school board race. They had one of the highest turnouts ever in the wow. panhandle in this election because what they cared about was the school board race. Not the governor's race, right? So if we were only looking at that data, if we had not looked at the data, we would have missed it. Because we would have been like, nobody voted in the last school board race, and we've got this governor's race. But what we did is we were informed. We had the numbers, but we went and talked to folks. And really, as an organizer, to really figure out where were the people, where was the energy, and literally use, our, use the numbers to inform what our strategy would be. And, and so now you're doing this on... on how do you pick the states then? I know you said initially you were, you know, sort of more towards the Southern. Do you, are you now looking at this next election and saying, well, we should be going into Michigan, Wisconsin, you know, we the, are. The, so the we're, it, states? Right. So we were very intentional about the South. One, because 50, the majority, the largest African-American population in the country sure. lives in the South. Sure. And so because our people are there, we felt like we need to be there. So we're in um, um uh, well, most of the states that we're in are in the south but we also have what we call two up south states um that we think the black vote is really key and critical that's michigan and pennsylvania um in addition to Min uh, michigan and pennsylvania this year we're going to do a little bit differently um and on our on our c4 side because we think this is such a critical moment um in the 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 uh, in democracy and protected democracy right now that we're also going to have kind of um, targeted communities, um, whether that's St. Louis, whether that's Milwaukee, but there's say, targeted, okay. targeted communities that we're working in. So we have a statewide strategy in those and states. Then micro and, and, and then some micro-targeting. Exactly. And here's a great question. How do you recommend we help others in our community engage given the tense arguments that break out in response to any political conversation? make the conversation not be political. What do I mean by that? Make the conversation, when we talk to people, one of the things that we would do, when we would talk to people and a lot of times folks would say, well, I don't wanna vote because they, they do what they wanna do anyway. We was like, oh, we understand. We feel like, we affirm them. We don't, like, you're not crazy. <laughs> like, we voted and look at my community, nothing has happened. We was like, yep, you're right. You're not crazy. And so part of what we do is we listen. You would be amazed at what listening can do, right? We would listen and listen to see what it is, what their concern is, and then we will find out, well, what is it that you're concerned about? So mm -hmm. we're not talking about politics, you're right. Tell us about what is it you're concerned on, about. And then we walk through a process of how engaging in the political process yes, won't even really save it. all, but how it would actually help you get yeah. where you're trying to go, right? So not necessarily that, and we tell people, we don't think that politics is the great remedy that's gonna solve all the problems of the world. That's not what we think. We don't think that we're gonna find a, the, the super candidate that is just gonna save all of us on a white horse. That's not what we believe. What we do believe though, is that we believe that there is power in self-governance we believe that there is power in self-agency. So that if anybody, I don't know about, and we tell folks this and they understand that, we're like, I don't know about you, but if anybody is making any decision about me and my life, I need to be a part of that decision-making process, right? And so, and we don't leave it just there. Part of our work is, Voting is a percentage of our work. It's a large part of our activity because that's what we do, but we don't call ourselves a voting organization. We're a power building organization. So one, the way that we engage is in an authentic conversation to really affirm that what people are feeling is not, they're not crazy. Like we never t say that people are apathetic because that's not what we believe. We believe that there's a variety of reasons why people don't engage in this process, right? And mm -hmm. so in many of those ways are authentic and many of those ways are, are valid, right? Um, secondly, we think that part of the conversation can't be centered around the personalities of who the political candidates are or the parties. It has mm -hmm. to be centered around how people want to um, transform or want to see changes in their community and to help them to be able to make the connection of how voting can be one vehicle to help with that process. And so that's kind of the work that we're doing is a, a larger frame, uh, which a deeper conversation around if, if I'm trying to build something different, mm -hmm. then I need to use every tool available, available to me to do that. And politics is one of those tools. Got it. So there's another question, you know, which is sort of the same thing. How to achieve a radical change in a very polarized media and political field. So I, I think it's wonderful that we're getting questions from 
all these, and I'm assuming they're younger people, um, you know, who are in college or who are focusing in on the polarization of where our politics is now? It's a great, it's, it's a great question. So let me say this, you know, um, when I was in Boston, I learned about this story of some folks who um, were getting taxed on some, some tea. And they decided to have a big tea party, right? And just throw the tea in a row. And it was like, we're not paying no more damn taxes on those tea. We're going to do something different. My point is change has always happened when there has been a committed few folks who really thought and had an idea that they deserved something better and were willing to create that. And we have to think in the same way. That's why my, my point to you is that um, even the person that wrote the question, thank you for asking that. Like, I mean, part of it will, what will keep you, what will make you be stuck? I can tell you this as an organizer, what would have me be stuck is I can see how, um, how I could change the, the whole, how could I change this big process? Like, yeah. just, I, I don't have any money. I don't come from a wealthy family. How can I make impact, right? I move millions of dollars now, right? Mm -hmm. And not because I can't, I can't because I, that's what I said I wanted to do. I was committed to that vision. And I literally took steps like to help me really manifest that what I wanted to see in the world. And I say that because I think it's important for us to recognize that is something, if something is bothering you, that's good. That might be that that thing is actually calling you to really be the person. You may be the person that we're waiting on. You mm -hmm. may be the person that, like it takes a committed few to really be able, when people know that it's, you're authentic, yeah. when, and it's a change and we gotta recognize that, that none of us, even change makers, don't like change. I was telling yeah. someone last year when the spices were changed in, my, in the grocery store, <laughs> I almost had a, Conniption. I was like, wait a minute, y'all changed the spice out? Um, because the way that we're wired, yeah. yeah, change is hard, right? And so you should expect, as we organize, we expect some resistance and change, but we're committed to change nevertheless. And so part of what has to happen is that I believe mighty rivers are filled drop by drop, mm -hmm. that it is each and every this little light of mine that has the audacity to believe that you have something to contribute to the world and that to believe that there are others in the world like you that mm -hmm. see the change and want the change, that that in fact, it has always been the element that has changed nations and countries and communities. And I believe that's still the fact that, that ultimately that we are in kind of this protracted space that it takes over time, but it's always been a committed few it has not been everybody, right? You know, we just celebrated Easter and they said Jesus had 12. My point is, <laughs> my point is it, it, it takes a, um, um, a core group of committed people with vision, with the kind of dedication, commitment and skills to literally be able to make the changes that we need. So I'm hoping, I am so hoping to see more young people run for office yeah. that are rooted and grounded um, in real politics, like, like, get beyond, turn the TVs off, stop listening to the pundit stuff, right? I say that as a political pundit, right? But, like, like, right? Yeah. Um, but I think that's really important that one, that, that part of what has to happen, you know, I, I often think about Harriet Tubman. Here's a woman, you know, um, we kind of, kind of, we kind of lift her up over history, but we don't really understand how amazing this woman was. Yeah, like sure. here is a woman that could not read and write, who was enslaved, right? Who had been abused and actually had, would have blackouts because of she was hit. And here's a woman that ultimately in the midst of not having any money, any education, any real support, right? Mm -hmm. Literally was so focused on freedom that not only did she get to freedom, but she changed the course of, and really freed others, wound up leading the military of freeing 700 slaves, um, um, wound up, um, and she had a $50,000 bounty on her head. Now think about that, $50,000 then, $50,000 is a big bounty now, right? And so here is a woman that her commitment was so, has such a profound impact on the world that here we are, hundreds of years later, and we're still lifting up her legacy. My point is, yes, you as an individual can help make a difference. You know, it may be at different scales, but you can make a difference. It is, you, sometimes you can't look at 
you can't try to fight to change and transform um, uh, trans and get so obsessed with, I've got to transform. I got to get you to believe what I believe. You've got to get solid and anchored in what you really firmly believe. And literally, if that is couch, like I show up, I try to show up authentically who I am. And on some point, I just accept that if I'm in a space of truth and love, that there are people that are going to be attracted to that. And then there's some that are not. And there's really nothing I can do to that. But I do believe that there is something very transformative that when we tap into our greatest yeah. spirit, our human, our humanity, that our sense of love and our sense of commitment, when people know that you are speaking from an authentic place, True. for some reason it is transformative. So we're about to close. So I want to thank you so much, Latasha, for joining us on so many levels. I think uh, if I can just sum it up, what you've taught us about politics and elections is if you start it with truth and love and follow it with your passion, it's all going to work out fine. And you are a stunning, out. stellar example. And uh, I'm just, uh, we're, all, we're all blessed and honored that you spent time to help us all feel a little bit better about what tomorrow may look like for all of us. So thank you, friend. Thank you, Susan. I thank so you. appreciate you. Um, thank and you. wellness to you and your family. Thank you. You too. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Take care, Latasha. Speak thank soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.